Okay, my friends, and welcome to the next episode here, the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A, where we help you to be fit and live free by taking a fundamental approach to diet and exercise. I'm Matt Schifferly. Today's episode is sponsored by the Grind Style Calisthenics Program. This is the official workout program here at Red Delta Project, which is basically taking body weight training and programming and purposefully making it all about building raw muscle and strength. If you came to me, you said, Matt, I don't really care about the circus tricks or anything fancy when it comes to calisthenics. And I also don't want to just waste my time with endless reps and lots of needless, tedious volume training. I just want to build raw muscle and strength with body weight training. Grind Style Calisthenics is the program that I designed for that. And the main manual for that is down below in the description, as well as the PDF for that. And we're going to be talking about how this applies to the Grind Style program with today's topic, which is using what I'm now starting to call power tempo or blast tempo training. This is something that I've been experimenting with for several months now. Clients are getting fantastic results from it. And it's just basically one of those small, well, not so much small, but easy to execute tricks, techniques, not a huge deal. It's really uh, simple. And once you kind of get used to it, it's real easy to implement into your workouts, whether it's calisthenics or weights or dumbbells or whatever you're using, but it can greatly amplify the stimulus that you're trying to create in your training. It can also potentially help remove stress from your nervous system, from your joints, make training a lot more enjoyable, not nearly as hard and stressful on mind, body, and lifestyle. And it all kind of depends on how we're programming it. So without further ado, let's just jump right into what it is. And of course, as always, I'll be answering your questions. Uh, ME is coming on in right off the bat saying, hey, Matt, what's your opinion about high kicks for self-defense? That's a funny thing that you should be asking that right now, because I'm reading a book right now on marketing that a friend of mine wrote, and he was basically saying how he was taking uh, street fighting. He was a street fighter, scrappy street fighter, and he was augmenting his straight street fighting skills with martial arts training. And he always was wondering about how, you know, how practical do you guys think these high kicks really are? Because as a Taekwondoist myself, you know, high kicks can be very practical. In the last tournament I was in, you know, the match I won was largely because I kept kicking the guy in the head, even though he was much taller than me. I don't know how I was able to do it, to be quite honest with you. But in that application, in the sport of martial arts, always remember that when it comes to applying your art to win a sport, that's very different from actual fighting, because what works in sport may not work in fighting and vice versa. Uh, but anyway, you're asking uh, spe specifically about my opinion. So it depends on the application as always, like any exercise or tool. So if you're a Taekwondoist and you get in the ring, dude, if you can get those kicks up towards head height level, they're fantastic. But from a self-defense standpoint, they may be a little bit more of a liability than anything else. Because if, boy, if you can get someone to stop a high kick, you're very, very vulnerable in that position. So that's why a lot of times you'll see people kicking relatively low in fighting or like MMA and stuff like that. I know you do see high kicks and stuff, but it's usually used more strategically within a combination or later on in the fight. So it depends on several things. One, the application. Two, how good are you at high kicks? You know, for me to kick high, I'm not the very most flexible guy. I don't have a whole lot of control up there. So my high kicks, not really the most proficient. They're not that fast. They're not that controlled. But I've known some people where they could literally stand two feet from you, say, I'm going to kick you in the head, and there's nothing I could do to stop them because they were that fast and they were that good. So it's always, it depends on the user and not necessarily the tool, as we'll be discussing about uh, power tempo training here as well. Victor saying, hey, Matt, what are your thoughts on counting reps and why is it important? This is a very good question. In fact, I kind of did a little bit of a mini video the other day about this. Because repetitions are almost like a genius aspect of strength training. Whoever invented the idea of counting reps basically made strength training work. And the reason for this is because there's only two fundamental variables when it comes to our strength training, which we're going to explore 
in a little bit here on why power tempo can really amplify things up, uh, which is how much tension is in the muscle and how long is it there for? And when you're using repetition counts, you're having a quantifiable measurement of both, right? So if you have a program and you say do 10 reps and then you progress it to 15 reps, now your muscles don't care how many repetitions you do. They only care about time. But if you went from doing 10 reps to 15 reps, that meant you went 50% longer at being able to generate that amount of tension. So repetitions are first and foremost, a timing mechanism. Second of all, it's a way to kind of get an idea for the intensity that you're working at. Because if I say you're doing a program and you're gonna do five reps, that doesn't mean do five reps of something that's relatively easy to do that you could do a hundred reps with. I'm saying do five reps by selecting a resistance that you can do with good difficulty, five reps. You know, if you're doing something that's something you can use for 10 reps, that's not what the program is about. So I know you're asking though, more along the lines of counting reps versus sometimes you hear people of just saying, just go for it. And again, it, it's fine either way. It's like a Jedi mind trick. When we get locked into thinking of, oh, I can only do 10 pull-ups, then we sometimes habitually build a limitation. A lot of times, and this is why I'm always saying that going to failure is actually far more subjective than we think it is. Lots of times when we think, okay, 10 reps is my max for pull-ups, we are ingraining that habitual limitation. It's not actually your real limit. It's a habitual limitation. And the more you do it, the more you're there. So sometimes you'll hear people say, stop counting reps as a way to bypass that little neural shortcut. And you just keep going and going and going and you blow right past your habitual limitations. So there's that. It's just a tool. It's for that application. It's for that type of thing. Sometimes people will use timing uh, like a stopwatch of how long you're doing an exercise versus repetitions. Again, same thing, you know, because you can bypass and make shortcuts of like, okay, I'm going to do 100 pushups. And you do these tiny little short things that take no time at all, in which case you're basically short cutting your ability to do something because you're just making it easier. Always got to be watching out for that. Whenever we take a quantifiable metric as a measure of progress, it ceases to become a reliable metric for progress, no matter what it is, weight, reps, uh, how much you weigh, your speed, all those sorts of things, because you can be very uh, compensatory if you want to call it that. You're basically cutting corners to bolster up that one thing. So on the whole, you know, rep counting is by far the standard. We're going to do it. We're, we should do it most of the time. But there are times we don't want to be counting reps, either to bypass those habitual limitations, or sometimes it could be just fun to use a stopwatch or something else. But remember that fundamentally, you're not doing anything different. You're just thinking about it in a different way, which can be all it takes. So we're talking about power training today. So what is power training? Power training, I know there's probably a name for this sort of thing out there. This is nothing new, of course, because nothing is new under the sun. Everything's just an age old idea that's been around for hundreds of years anyway, given a new coat of paint and a new label. But it's uh, basically when we are doing our repetitions in calisthenics, where we are forcefully putting a lot of acceleration and speed on the concentric port of, part of the repetition. So when you're lifting up against gravity, so if you're doing a push-up, you're pushing off the floor with a lot of force, sharp breath, really, really quick. And then you come down in a controlled manner, and you blast up. This is what I sometimes call it blast style, blast tempo training, is because it's like down, push up hard, down, push up hard, down, push up hard, and so on. A couple little details to mention right off the bat. This is an acceleration of your repetition. It's not a quick like jerk where you're trying to snap right on up. And sometimes I've seen people do this where they'll blast up and then they'll go really, 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 really slow on the eccentric when they're lowering themselves down. You want to come down under control, but you don't need or have much benefit from going that slow. This was usually based off the idea that, okay, the eccentric portion of a repetition is usually where we have a bit more muscle damage. And for a while, it was believed that muscle damage was the primary driving force with hypertrophy. So therefore, if the eccentric is driving muscle damage, then really take your time and do a slow eccentric. And that's going to create more muscle damage and hopefully 
produce more hypertrophy. Uh, subsequent research did not bear that out very much. In fact, if anything, these days, a lot of the research is suggesting that muscle damage still probably plays some role in stimulating hypertrophy, but it's probably not as much as we think it does. Uh, because there's plenty of examples of people creating lots of muscle damage and no muscle growth happens at all. And so when we're looking at these tempo trainings, you want to come down under a controlled motion. I always think of like loading up a spring and then releasing the spring, like blasting off, load and explode, load and explode. Very satisfying way to train, very, very engaging. It's something that you have to really focus and concentrate on. It's athletic, it's powerful, and it has a whole host of benefits, which we will be driving into here shortly. But let me get to some more questions here. Victor, uh, oh, sorry, I got that already. We got uh, Samuel Tak. Thank you very much for the donation, Samuel. He's asking, what would you consider, or would you consider doing another video where you see how much you can deadlift? Not really. And here's the reason why. I have always been horrifically bad at anything involving a barbell. And I never quite figured out why. But for me, I've always been incredibly weak and terrible. I mean, horrifically bad at any type of barbell training, especially powerlifting. And it's just, this is the way humans are, right? Like I could write an A plus paper in my sleep in English class, but ask me to uh, do any sort of math in, you know, even grade school, you know, level uh, arithmetic, and I'm probably going to fail it. We as human beings, we always have our strengths and our weaknesses. We always have some things that we're very good at, some things we're not so good at, and some things we're mediocre, moderate at, and so forth. And in our fitness culture, we have this thing that I call the barbell standard. The barbell standard is that we basically judge people's ability overall as far as strength and, and uh, power based on how much they can work with a barbell. But it's the old question, you know, if you tell a fish that their success as a fish is based on how well they can climb a tree, they're going to think they're a failure as a fish for the rest of their life. You know, and that's, that's how human adaptation works. Like I can ride my mountain bike for hours and hours and be faster than most everyone out there. But ask me to run a mile and I'm going to basically, you know, cramp up in the seas after even a few hundred yards. I suck at running. I'm a horrible runner. You do not want me on a 5K team. Believe me. For me to swim across a swimming pool is an act of Congress. You know, I am horrible at swimming. So do you look at me and say, well, you can't run, therefore your endurance sucks? It's like, yeah, but I can ride 50 miles on a mountain bike without any preparation. So it's the same thing with strength, right? I don't do the, the barbell test because it's always going to be bad. It's always going to be terrible. There was one period of my training career where I really tried to get a lot better at the classic barbell lips, the squats, the benches, and the deadlifts. And I got a lot better than normal. But I guarantee you, 90% of you watching this video are probably stronger than me at those, even at my very best for uh, those exercises. So that's why I don't do them, because I don't want people to see me perform terribly at something I'm not good at. I'm never going to be good at it. And if I really invest and try to be the best at it, I'm going to be average at best. But does that mean that I'm not strong? No, because I do calisthenics. There's that video out there. There's a cool YouTube channel out there called Strength Wars. And they would pair, you know, a bodybuilder versus a power lifter. And they'd have them go through this workout, you know, as a contest and everything. And they would, they had a, a, a couple of calisthenics guys go. And of course they always lose. And in the comments, everybody's ragging on the calisthenics guys. And it's like, yeah, no kidding. The weightlifter wins at a weightlifting contest. What did you think was going to happen? You know, put them in a cal calisthenics contest. The opposite would be the case. So I'm not a weightlifter. I don't lift weights, uh, external weights very much. I'll dabble with a kettlebell and dumbbells every once in a while, but I'm a body weight guy. So why am I trying to lift a barbell? I'm not making excuses. I suck at barbell training. I'm always going to suck at barbell training. So why am I trying to prove something that I know is going to be bad? I'd rather show you what I can do on a mountain bike because <laughs> that's going to be a lot better. All right, Casper saying, hey, Matt, do you have any tips 
on not feeling extremely guilty eating pizza every once in a while, maybe once a month. Good question. Um, yeah, and Victor, thank you very much for the for the tip. I will get to that in just a second here. Um, here's the deal, all right? There's a lot of messages in our fitness culture telling you how you're supposed to feel about your habits and behavior. But the fact of the matter is your success does not come from your habits, okay? It does not, your, your dietary success does not come from what you eat. Never blame or never trust diet to healthy nutrition. And that's because fundamentally, there are so many other variables that come into play about your health and how lean you are and your performance and your strength, that that pizza is one influence. That doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Of course it matters, of course, yeah. But is it really that big a deal? Is it really that big of an influence, especially when you're only eating it once in a while? No, it really does anything. Plus, when we eat food, remember, our body does not use food. We consume food, but our body uses nutrients. So no matter what you eat, this is fundamentally how food works, right? This is not a theory. This is just nutrition 101. When you consume food, your body's like pizza. Great. I can't do a damn thing with pizza. What do you want me to do? There's nothing I can do with this. So it engages in this thing called digestion. And digestion is nothing more than basically taking the food like a giant Lego set and taking it apart. It's breaking it down. It, it breaks down nutrients here and it breaks down carbohydrate into, um, uh, into simple sugars and, you know, and then the amino acids from proteins and triglycerides from fat. Basically, when we digest food, it breaks things apart into its components. And then it says, okay, I got these components. What do I need to do with them? What do I, how can I use them? And that's the healthiness of food. That's what dictates whether or not a food is healthy or not not what the food actually is. I don't care if you're eating pizza or chocolate bars or eggs or whatever. It's always about what are the nutritional components that your body breaks it down into. And by the time it's broken down, it doesn't matter what the food was. You know, if you have leucine from steak and eggs or leucine from pepperoni, your body is, leucine is just leucine. Your body will break it down into the component that it needs. Now, the reason why some foods get a bad rap is because some foods just simply provide better uh, nutrient value than others relative to caloric intake as well. Pizza is a high calorie food. And in our fitness culture, we're typically fighting the war on obesity kind of thing and overeating. So anything with a high calorie value is typically deemed as bad or unhealthy. But again, that has no context whatsoever to you, right? It, the ability to be healthy from a food depends on how well you can use it. If you're, you consume that pizza and you get benefit from it, it's as healthy as anything else out there. So this guilt that we have has nothing to do with sound nutrition principles. It has no bearing whatsoever with dietary fundamental approaches. It is all these messages in our fitness culture, which are largely completely made up and dreamed out of nowhere. You see this all the time when it comes to new diets that come about, right? When the low fat thing was all over the place in the 90s, people felt guilty for eating like sausage and bacon and butter and stuff. And then the Atkins and low fat or low carb thing hit. And suddenly people are like, I was so good this weekend. I had a lot of bacon and eggs and cheese. And, you know, it's like, so how do we go from feeling bad about eating food one day and then we feel great about eating food the next and that's just another proof positive that how we feel on an emotional level is really what's driving the bus here. You know, so much in our fitness culture and even the, you know, general pop culture in general says feelings don't matter. That's nonsense. Most of your life is going to be controlled by how you feel about things, regardless of science, regardless of logic, regardless of truth. And people, especially in the social media space, know this. There's no, there's no value in teaching people anything. The brainwashing doesn't work. If you can get someone to feel something, you can make them believe and act and do whatever you want them to do. Our feelings are at the same time our biggest liability, but they're also our biggest asset as long as we can control it. So when we feel bad about doing something, which is usually meaningless and trivial, like eating pizza, that's an opportunity to look into it and be like, why do I feel bad that I just ate pizza? There's nothing wrong with pizza. My body, I, in fact, a lot of times when people 
kind of mess up on their diet, I'll ask them, well, how do you feel like physically? And so much of the time they'll be like, dude, I feel amazing. My energy level feels great. You know, and that sore nagging little itchy throat I've had for the past few weeks, it's gone. And it's like, a, I had a great workout. I'm like, you should listen to that then. Who cares if someone says pizza is not healthy? You eat pizza, you feel better, it's healthy. End of discussion. Follow your experience. Who cares if someone says something's not healthy? They're basing it off of pseudoscience anyway. You know, we want to be basing things off of what's going to be the most satisfying for you. And when you realize, man, I feel so much better when I have pizza every once in a while, it's healthy. And you should base your feelings on that outcome. And no more guilt is what's going to happen there. Victor, thanks again for the tip, sir. Uh, saying, thanks for the answer. I meant I don't count reps and should I start? Oh, very good. Uh, you answered the question by saying it's a metric for progress. Thanks. Yeah, so you don't have to always count reps. You can certainly use it as a metric for your duration of how you're doing things, as long as your technique and range of motion and stuff is fairly consistent. Uh, and yeah, you don't need to do it all the time. It's simply something that you can use for a metric of, okay, let's see how many pull-ups I can do. But you know, with the grind style system, you know, we're very rarely ever pushing the rep metric anyway. So it's not necessarily something that needs to be done. It's more of just as a way to make sure you're consistent because it's also very possible to, you know, jump up on the pull-up bar there and be like, okay, I can consistently get 10 reps, but then you habitually just go with whatever you feel like doing for the day. And it, that 10 becomes eight, becomes seven, becomes six. And then you keep doing six to seven repetitions for a while. And then you lose your ability to do 10 repetitions. So you don't need to do it all the time, but once in a while, just to make sure you're still kind of sticking to things as well. Mariano, it's so good to see you. Thanks. Hey Matt, is this change in uh, charge and explode technique? I like that term too. How could you adopt a pause at the beginning and end of the repetition? Or are they opposing techniques? No, I definitely think the, the pause is there because Ultimately, we're looking for the essence of pure strength training by utilizing this technique, which is, of course, control. Control is what we're after with this type of training and any strength training in general. And so a lot of times when people use faster tempo, they're using a lot of momentum and they're kind of bouncing out of their technique. They're kind of going like one, two, three, four, five, six. And so you're not necessarily that much in control of it because control is actually about your ability to handle a range of performance metrics. Okay, so I'll say that again, control in training is about being able to perform a range of metrics. So by having the opposing slow load and then explosive power on the concentric with a little bit of a pause just to kind of minimize the momentum, then you're going to have far more control over the repetition over the muscle and over the tension. And that's the benefit of doing this is it's giving you more control over your muscle because in the grind style calisthenics series, remember that we have four phases in our typical workout. Okay? We have our first phase, which is tension control because you can only work a muscle to the degree you can engage it. Most of us have terrible muscle engagement somewhere or at least if we haven't worked on it before and that's why we often use isometrics. It's part of our neural warmup, so to speak you're also only as strong as you are stable. So the second phase of a GSC workout is stability training. And we're not standing on BOSU balls or doing any of that nonsense. We're shift work most of the time, shifting squats, shifting pushups, shifting type of, of rows and pull-ups. This is taking our control of the ability to generate tension, and we're distributing that tension throughout our body in a synchronized and coordinated fashion. So everything's kind of turning on. So that's phase two. Phase three is the strength or proficiency phase. And this is where you are trying to get the most out of your muscle in a very concentrated way. But of course, fatigue is kind of the enemy of strength and proficiency. So we're not taking things to a high degree of fatigue in this phase of our training. And so if you're like, okay, I'm going to do focus on strength uh, for my push chain. All right. You might do like an archer push up, and you're getting like three to five repetitions on each side, even though you could potentially do six to seven repetitions. You're saving a couple in the tank because you don't want to burn out. You don't want to exhaust yourself because when you do exhaust yourself, you're compromising your strength and proficiency of subsequent sets. That fatigue builds up relatively quickly. 
So we're trying to keep the fatigue a little bit at bay, and we just use as many sets as we can get with a good strong rep or proficiency, like if you're doing like calisthenic skills or something to that degree. And then once you start to notice your fatigue is starting to build up, then you have your finisher phase, which is basically modest levels of resistance, and you just blast the hell out of the muscle and drive it to a high degree of fatigue for one or two sets. And that is kicking off a lot of that stimulus for hypertrophy. So that's the classic grind style calisthenics program. Has a built-in warm-up, ensures you're covering all of the bases that you need in order to sufficiently train your muscles, because most of us are lacking somewhere in there with our training system. And it ensures that you're also having a good solid plan as far as the chain training goes with push, pull, squat being your primary ways. So what does the power tempo training do? Well, when we are blasting and accelerating on the concentric, one, a lot of research has suggested that that improves your tension creation, your tension control. There was a, a article that came out a while ago. I think it was on Stronger by Science. And I was getting questions about it where people are saying that this research suggested that one of the best ways to improve the tension control, that mind-muscle connection, was to do an exercise faster like jumping or something. Because when we are trying to do something quickly, it's kind of like, you know, Captain Kirk on the Enterprise going, more power, Scotty. And Scotty's going, I can give it her all she's got, Captain. It's like, damn it, I need more power. So our nervous system naturally starts looking for pockets of weakness. Like, well, the triceps aren't working really that much. So get those on even more. Or the hips aren't really working as much as they could on the legs. So get those to work even more. So if you've got muscles that are somewhat sleepy and not really contributing that much, it forces them to really ramp up. Okay, so tension control, improved, great. Two, stability. Because when we move at a bit of a faster pace, it amplifies imbalances and weaknesses. So you see this a lot with like lunges and uh, like single arm work that I give people where they'll go with a fast concentric and they'll wibble and wobble, or they won't go in a straight line. Like if they're slow, they're smooth. But as soon as they power up, their shoulders hunch up, or you know they're kind of twisting their body a little bit. So that's amplifying the imbalances to make them a little bit more prevalent. So by trying to have more control during that power, you're also automatically creating that synergy and stability within your muscles. It's really kind of weird how it works. My hips feel like they're rock solid now since implementing this with a lot of my single leg training. Strength? Yeah, sure, obviously, definitely strength because when you are trying to move an object faster, you have to create more tension in the muscle just due to simple physics. Right? An object at rest stays at rest. Object in motion stays in motion. So the more force and or acceleration you import, impart upon an object, including your body, the more tension you need to generate. And since more tension is just basically more strength and vice versa, then that's also amplifying the amount of strength you're generating during the repetition. So we've got those first three things, tension control, stability, and strength from just accelerating the concentric portion of a lift. Now, I'm not saying that's going to be as efficient or, or, or effective as breaking up your workouts into four phases. Again, I still feel like having a purpose-built exercise and the warm-ups and everything is still going to be the best way to go about it. But by having that little bit of oomph in your concentric does mean that you are getting more of those three things from your training and you're not adding anything to your workouts. You don't need extra exercises. You don't need to do anything uh, in addition to what you're doing, any extra sets or anything, you're just putting a little bit of extra oomph into the concentric and it's automatically giving you more of all three of those things. And that's why it's the next evolution in the grind style calisthenics program, because GSC is ultimately about improving your neuromuscular proficiency. And those first three things are going to come more so from this power type of tempo. And that's why it's mentioned in this way. So put a pause button there because I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about programming for this to really make it work for you in a second. But let me get to some more of these questions. Joseph Bello, it's good to see you. Hello, Matt. If I use this tempo slow on the way down and explode on the way up and pause for two seconds at the bottom of a push-up or squat, can that fatigue a muscle faster or grow more muscle? It will fatigue it faster. 
but I would say that the two seconds is probably a bit excessive. You want just enough pause to kind of get rid of the, the bounce, as it were. And it will fatigue it faster, but depends on what phase you're in. If you're in the strength phase, you don't want to fatigue a muscle faster. You don't want that. Uh, so you're going to get less reps or less power. So it's going to compromise the stimulus of the strength phase. And if you're in the uh, hypertrophy phase, yeah, we want that fatigue. But I would much rather get that fatigue from just doing the rep harder and more, more repetitions. I think you're going to get more from that. So I, I think two seconds is going to be a little bit um, of a uh, excessive amount. If you know, though, that you're like, I just don't have good shoulder control at the bottom of my push-ups, like I'm struggling with the push-up hunch or my elbows are winging out and wobbling all over when I'm doing ring dips or something, then yeah, having a bit more of a pause to emphasize the control can be a good way. But that's why I would use a bit more of a pause is to make sure you're building up that control and not struggling out of the hole as it were. But beyond that, I wouldn't quite rest that much uh, for, for those purposes. Super Prime 117, it's good to see as always. Hey man, I always had posture issues, but recently started uh, deep tissue massage to loosen tight muscles, but also doing this along with active mobility and strengthening the weak muscles that causes imbalances. Absolutely, my friend. So that's the thing is, you know, our body is afflicted with tightness and weakness at the same time. Whenever we have posture issues, we're like, oh, my upper back is so tight and I get headaches and stuff. Yes, you're dealing with tightness, but tightness and weakness are bedmates to one another. Whenever you're dealing with tightness in the body, you're also dealing with weakness, which is why I'm a big fan of mobility exercises that require some degree of the use and generation of muscle tension and strength. Deep squats, shifting push-ups, you know, deep um, uh, uh, dips, uh, things that are strength-based that require a lot of mobility and mobility that requires at least some degree of strength. Now, I get uh, massages myself on a regular basis too, and it certainly does wonders for me. So I all the other, the deep tissue and all that stuff that you're doing, fantastic, great. But whenever we're dealing with something that is about releasing tension, but it doesn't do anything with strength, things like foam rolling, it's not nearly as efficient or productive. So use that stuff and the Theraguns and everything like that is great for temporary relief. But unless you're addressing the real issues on why that tension is there in the first place, it's just going to keep coming back, which usually means that there's an imbalance in the creation of muscle tension throughout your body somehow. And my fun experience with power tempo is that it does help to balance things out to some degree. Like my posture is better. My body feels a lot better. I'm noticing my kicks are better in Taekwondo. It's like things feel like they're balancing themselves out again, because I have to have the things balance out in order to move at a faster pace uh, for the concentric. So always remember that tightness is also weakness, not just, oh, this muscle's tight. I need to like stretch it out and things like that. And it, and it does depend on what, what it is and applying what stretches and, and strength training you may need. James Wood saying, hey Matt, uh, are you going to do a video demonstrating this technique with various exercises? Yes, absolutely. There's already a video on the RDB channel that I posted yesterday that kind of shows me doing some stuff very rudimentary on the rings, uh, but I'll be doing a lot more videos uh, showing this. I mean, it's going to be everything I do uh, from now on to a very large degree. Uh, so this is kind of my primary MO for the time being. I'll then, or Aiden, excuse me, Aiden Ryan saying, I'm fairly new, don't have much of a routine for, uh, yeah, pull, push, 30 squat, very good. Uh, which one of your books would you recommend to begin with? Grind, micro-weighted, uh, want to gain muscle and mobility around a busy schedule. Very good. So there's lots of ways that you can start off with things. I usually recommend, let me grab a, a couple here, excuse me. So the place where I usually tell people to start is either the grind style calisthenics, because that's kind of the foundational program that we have here at RDP. Uh, and this is, of course, progressive and weighted calisthenics. This is my latest book, because if you're coming into the world of bodyweight training and you say, I want to build muscle and strength, you need to know basic progressive calisthenics theory. There's just no two ways about it. 
And that's the biggest hindrance that a lot of people have when they're trying to build muscle and strength is they don't really know or they don't have a good understanding of progressive calisthenics theory. Like you got, you gotta have at least 15 different ways to progress push-ups. You know, and usually when people say, well, how do I do push-ups to build more muscle and strength? It's like, well, I'll just do more reps, I guess. Or I, I guess I could do one arm push-ups. That's kind of like walking into a gym and saying, well, we got an empty barbell or we've got 315. That's all you can lift. <laughs> it's, it, there's so many holes that are there. So usually it's one of these things. Grind style calisthenics will still give you a very good place to start when it comes to some of the best exercises that I feel are for just straight up building muscle and strength. This is more comprehensive and giving you just more tools when it comes to progressive and weighted calisthenics. And I was going to write a separate book on weighted calisthenics, but really it, you don't need another book for that. <laughs> it's not enough information to comprise an entire book. And so fundamentally too, weighted and progressive calisthenics, fundamentally, they're actually the exact same thing. You're just using different tools. So that's why I put it into one book. So this is kind of like two books in one, if you want to think of it that way. So those are the two that I would recommend start with. Flip a coin, <laughs> go with whichever one feels, feels best for you. James Wood saying, hey, Matt, uh, how is this different from standard, uh, um, I'm assuming you're trying to pronounce uh, plyometrics. Thanks for great content. So plyometrics is very different, actually, because plyometrics is using the stretch load reflex of the body to generate power. So you'll see this where people will jump off a box and then immediately jump back up. Because when we, and I'm not that up on the science of plyometrics, so I know I'm going to get something wrong here. But when you load your tissues and then you explode right off, you're generating a lot of force very, very quickly. But part of what you're doing there is you're generating that force from the loading reflex. You're using your nervous system for that, which as an athlete is incredibly important. With this type of training though, you don't want that loading reflex because we don't want it to bounce out and carry you into the more power from the loading reflex, which is basically you're loading up your tissues, your ligaments, your tendons, your muscles and everything and acting like a spring. We don't want that spring, okay? You wanna load up, have a subtle pause at the bottom and then you drive and the drive is almost entirely from the activation of your muscle fibers, which is very different from actual technical uh, plyometric training. You're getting a very similar result, which is explosive power, but you're going through different mechanical means to generate that power. With plyometrics, it's muscle, but it's also a lot of tissues and spring-loaded reflex. With this, we're trying to just do straight muscular engagement, and we don't want that spring-loaded reflex going on. Very good question. Very good question. I like the way you're thinking. Touch of Grace saying, as a sports uh, ma mass massive massage therapist, I'm assuming, I'm a big fan of combining deep tissue with PT. Very good. Yeah, when the two are combined, oh, it's fantastic. Uh, I had some serious back issues for years. I mean, well over a decade. And by a combination of chiropractic work, which was basically massage, uh, actual massage, and strengthening and stretch strengthening those areas, it made a hell of a difference. Wish I had found that combination earlier. Thank you. And Touch of Grace is always saying, I use Thera Guns to warm tissue before stretching and mobility. Good idea. Never really thought to do that. That's a very good insight. I'll have to try that. Thank you for the tip. So continuing on with what are we doing with this power tempo training? So we covered some of the benefits of you can get more activation, more stability and coordination, and more strength. Great, wonderful. But what about the programming aspects of it? Because a lot of the ability to use any tool in strength and conditioning and fitness in general depends on how you program it. You, know, you could take a hammer and hit a nail the wrong way and you break the nail instead of actually accomplishing what you want. Same thing with your body. Well, there's a couple of things to be aware of. Number one is you want to use enough resistance that you can have controlled acceleration or as I call it, a controlled acceleration. What that means is if you're using a level of resistance that's so low that you can achieve what I like to call float. So if I'm doing standard push-ups and I can blast off and at the very top, I'm slightly weightless or my hands are coming off the ground and I don't have any load on the muscle, too light. That's not enough resistance. 
So now you're just blasting off, which is good for power training, but it's not quite getting what we want out of the technique. On the other hand, if you have so much load that there's no acceleration at all, so say I'm doing like one arm push up, and if I go slow, I take about two and a half seconds to go up. And if I go really fast, it takes like two and a half seconds to go up, then I know the load is a little too high for that because I'm not quite getting that acceleration to it. Now, you don't necessarily need to move a lot faster with things. You can still certainly use a good degree of load because you're trying to accelerate with this, but you do want to have a notable acceleration of speed. So when it comes to selecting your resistance, that's the way you want to do it. You want it to be heavy enough so you don't have float, but you want it to be light enough so you can get at least some driving acceleration to it. Second is when it comes to those coveted second or third and fourth phases of grind style calisthenics, where we're using fatigue and the strength to endurance ratio in order to focus on building either strength or fatigue and hypertrophy. Here's the simple way to do this, which is that when you're doing your sets, you don't go to failure as in you can't do any more reps. You go to failure as in when you can no longer accelerate and go fast. And will say that again. So if you're doing push-ups and you're bang, farce, force, force, and you get what I like to call a grind rep, you're done. Now, of course, you can keep doing more reps. You could probably eke out a few more, but you don't want those in the strength phase because those grind reps are going to pew, they're going to skyrocket your fatigue and compromise your ability to have strength and power in subsequent sets. So you're only going as far as you can with generating a good amount of that force and acceleration. However, once you start to notice the fatigue is starting to really build up in your muscles and you're like, okay, I'm about done here. Then for the hypertrophy side of things, when we do want the fatigue, then you just include those grind reps. So you would just blast through. And when you're starting to slow down, you just keep going and you go and you go and you go until you're starting to really grind out those last excruciating reps. So in this way, again, we have all four phases of grind style calisthenics. We're creating all four stimuli but we're not necessarily having to do different exercises, different phases of the workout, different aspects of things. And, and I do really do believe that if you have the time and the energy and stuff, you're still going to get more out of including all four phases. However, if time is short, you can do this with just getting down and getting the workout in. You get your archer push-ups and through just blasting out with the archer push-ups, five on each side, for example, you're getting the tension control, the stability, and the strength, and then you're stopping short for the first several sets to avoid those grind reps that are going to skyrocket the fatigue and the muscle. But then when you start to notice, all right, I'm starting to wrap things up here, then you just simply include those grind reps back in, and that's going to create more hypertrophy in the muscle, therefore getting that last uh, round of things, that last phase. So you're getting all of it in just one exercise for several sets, and then you've got all of your bases covered. So this is how it saves so much time and so much energy potentially in your grind style approach, which is one of the reasons why I like it so much. More questions here. Karsten, how's it going? Hey, Matt, in, is Grease the Groove the way of getting better at pull-ups? I really need to get over my four reps in the sets use pull-ups in the power tempo training. Absolutely. You can use anything that's dynamic with power tempo training. Uh, so usually when it comes to getting more repetitions, uh, grease the groove can help. But remember, the whole point of grease the groove is to just get better at what you're doing. So it's practice, in other words. And the thing that drives better practice is you're trying to do the repetitions better. Now, to a degree, it may help to just do more and just get more used to the exercise. Absolutely, I've seen that happen before. But remember that you can't do more repetitions because the repetitions you're doing now are not good enough. That's how you get more reps. So your focus should still be on proficiency and doing those four reps to the best of your ability. So what usually when people are like, I can't do more reps, I'll usually say, so what is lacking in the reps you're already doing? Because if you do use grease the groove, and you just keep doing things the same way, the same technique, the same speed, all that sort of thing. And you're not actually getting better at it. You're just reinforcing the pattern 
and you're putting in more work for basically the same stimulus. It's a, just a redundant act. So you're investing more time and energy and maybe not getting much out of it. So the goal should always be, I want to get better at doing pull-ups. I want to improve how well I can do them. And uh, power tempo training is certainly a way to do that by improving your tension control, by improving your activation, by improving your control, by improving your synergy, by improving your stability, by improving just little areas that could be weaker. Like when I started doing power tempo training with pull-ups, I started to notice for that first week, it's like, gosh, my forearms, like they're really feeling it, you know, the next day. Why, why are my forearms? It's because I'm you know, pulling hard. My grip has to work just a little bit harder. And that clued me in that, well, maybe my grip is one of the weak links in my pull-ups. Very well, maybe. And then that will strengthen that up and up you go. You, you'll now have more power to it. So bottom line is, sure, go ahead, give Grease the Groove a shot as long as you just have energy for it. You know, don't force it or anything. You always want to bring a good amount of energy into your training. But uh, I would give the power tempo training a shot even in your normal thing. And that alone may be enough to level up your repetitions because it's going to improve the proficiency of your pull-up automatically. Mackerel, it's good to see you. Hey, Matt, I started using isometrics for hypertrophy. According to your uh, setup, 20 seconds, 10 second rest, 15 seconds, 10 seconds. Very good. Uh, finish, uh, finish. How long should I rest after one cycle? And should I repeat the cycle? Uh, it's a standard recommendation, rest as needed. You know, because the amount of rest you need in recovery in between sets depends on a lot of different variables. It's impossible to give any sort of single dogmatic approach of this is how long you should rest because it depends on conditioning, depends on your focus, depends on how hard you're pushing the fatigue level, depends on the muscle you're working, depends on the exercise. It depends on many, 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 many things. So that's why I'm always more flexible about it and saying just rest as needed. You want to rest enough so that you can get into the next set or the next rep in isometrics with a good amount of focus and intensity. Bring a lot to it. You just don't rest so much that you're losing your edge, that you're losing your mental concentration. You go and scroll on social media for five minutes. You take a phone call, you get distracted. And before you know it, you're totally just out of the zone when it comes to your strength training. So rest as needed, but no more than that. And you're saying, <clears throat> see if there's anything I missed here. Hit me more questions, folks, if you have anything with it comes to this power tempo. But the bottom line with the power tempo training is you just got to experience it. it. Like anything in life, and especially when it comes to fitness, that you can talk about it, you can learn about it, you can hum and haw and ask for people's opinions and stuff on Reddit and everything, and everybody's going to give you their opinions as if it really matters all that much, including my own. But the bottom line is you just give it a shot. Just try it and see what your experience is, because you're going to learn far more from five minutes of experience than you would from who knows how much time of searching online or trying to figure out if something's going to work or not. And you, if you find ways to bring this up and change and modify, it's like, okay, I, I, maybe you find I am better off having two second pause at the bottom. Maybe I am better off using less range of motion for my shoulders. Whatever, whatever changes you make that give you a positive feedback from your experience, do that. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't put two seconds of pause at the bottom. Seems excessive. If you do it and you get a great positive result from it, then you do it. <laughs> it's that simple. So experiment with it, play with it, but it shouldn't be anything that is going to be uh, totally radical and different from what you're already doing. And that's one of the best things about it is you're not really doing anything that different. You're just putting this little bit more emphasis of acceleration on the concentric portion of the repetitions of the exercises you're already doing, of the program you're already using. It's not this big radical change, but it does create a ripple effect neuromuscular wise or in your nervous system that is going to create some noticeable improvements. I'm very confident of that. Dark Engine is asking, uh, discipline, experimentation, pragmatiz pragmatism always seems like the best bet to me with all the conflicting advice in terms of fitness and nutrition. Absolutely, 100%. Always remember, my friends, that you're the one in control here. You're in the driver's seat of your habits. Don't let other people tell you what you should be doing. 
my role here as a YouTube influencer, whatever you they were calling it these days, right? The, all I'm here to do is give you ideas. I can't tell you what to do. I don't know what's best for you. There's no way I can possibly know that. My job is to just give you an idea saying, guys, this seems pretty cool. Give it a shot. See what happens. And your experience that you get from trying out ideas, that's what you listen to. That's the thing that you pay more attention to. Like we were talking earlier about eating pizza. If you eat pizza like every Friday night and you're like, I don't know why, but I just feel better doing this. My diet's more on point. I have better energy. I just feel more rested at the end of the weekend. I just feel better if I have more pizza in my diet. Then that is what you should be basing your diet off of. If you're getting the positive result, that's all that matters. And you're going to have people who find that as a threat because we all take comfort in our dogmatic ideas. We all take comfort and security into if I do it this way, that's going to be the best thing. It's going to protect me from the ills. And so there's nothing more threatening to any individual who's scared of an, of, uh, of an occurrence or an event than someone who's not following the advice they think is so important and they're getting better results because of it. <laughs> You know, because they think, oh, these rules are going to protect me. These rules are going to save me. And when someone else out there is breaking those rules and getting even better results, that's a threat. That's a threat to that comfort. So you're going to get some flack no matter what you're doing, of course. So that's why you just got to listen to your own experience and do what makes you feel good and what you're doing uh, as far as your experience. And if you're doing something great and it works for you, great. And if it doesn't no longer work uh, and it's no longer a positive thing, well then change it up. A couple of last questions here to finish off. Leroy, the man, it's good to see you as always saying, Hey Matt, uh, for an intermediate lifting strength program, how would you program heavy single singles for auto regulation in the big three weekly, monthly? Would you go true max or just be on 90, 95%? So it, you're going to have to kind of feel this one out a little bit. Uh, one of the things about going that heavy is that you want to prepare for it. Uh, you want to be make sure you're getting good sleep. You want to make sure that your training for a week or two before it is just on point and you're consistent. Your technique feels solid. Uh, it, there's a number of things that you just want to make sure that you are getting your ducks in a row and you want to be at your best. Think of it like a competition. Think of it like I've got a powerlifting competition coming up. It's an informal in-house competition, but nonetheless, a competition nonetheless. How would you prepare for that sort of thing? And so you want to be looking at that as far as being able to bring your best forward and then just see what's best for you. Now, I've known guys out there, they're like, yeah, I try my max out every week. And other people are like, I did that and it totally crushed me and it ruined my joints. So everybody's a little bit different on as far as how hard they can push at that level of intensity. Uh, so that's why uh, you should check out uh, Dan John's book, Easy Strength. Easy Strength is basically based on the idea that if you can level up your lower levels of intensity, everything above it will also rise up. So that's the premise behind it is if you're constantly lifting 50% max, which isn't very much, it's like, okay, it's fairly light. But if you get better at that lift, then you're also going to get better at 85%, 90%, and you know, your one rep max. So it's not like you need to test your one rep max in order to know you're getting stronger. Because if you're getting stronger at a lighter weight, you're probably getting stronger at your one rep max as well, depending on how close you are to it as, as well as far as being able to get what you want out of it. If you're always lifting in the 20 to 30 rep range, then lifting that heavy is going to be a hell of a shock to your system. But if you're always, you know, five to eight or so, then yeah, that improving that will definitely bring up your one rep max. And you probably will find you don't need to test it all that much in order to know that you're getting stronger to that level. So, all right, folks, I will leave you to your devices. Go forth, try out Power Tempo Training. Check out the video, the shorter video, which is more of a demonstration of it on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel. It's the latest video that I just posted. Go check it out, play with it. Let me know if you have questions, Red Delta Project Instagram and so forth is a good place to ask me questions on that. And if you need anything further, there's always just my email, reddeltaproject at gmail.com. Check out the books down below listed, Grind Style Calisthenics, which we've been talking about, and of course, Progressive and Weighted Calisthenics to give you your foundation for building muscle and strength with bodyweight training. I will talk to you folks next time. Till then, be fit and live free.